And welcome to January 2021 and a new edition of Adventures in Careerland. Hey everyone, I'm Adriano Magnifico. I'm your host. I'm the career and entrepreneurship consultant for Luriel School Division. And this is the new year. Oh my gosh, we're in episode number 12. So we're at the Dirty Dozen of the Adventures in Career Land Collection. And as usual, I'm joined by my able, intelligent, thoughtful assistants who are going to leave us soon because they have to go on to greener pastures. But yeah. they've been such great people. So we have our Brazilian, Isabella. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Very good. What do you do in New Year's in Brazil? In New Year's, it's always a party. So a lot of people go to the beach and they like jump three waves because that's good luck for the year. Um, and there's always a lot of fireworks. Um, yeah, a lot of people just hang out as a family. You jump three waves. And so that's good that, that's good luck. What does that mean? I don't get it. Is it the number three? We I talked about this no number three. I have no idea, honestly. Like, this is just a tradition. Um, and we honestly don't believe in it. It's just something fun that people do. Oh, my gosh. It sounds religious. And, of course, we're with Lily Chen. Hello. Our Chinese ambassador. <laughs> and these are both international students who have chosen the broadcast and media program at the Arts and Technology Center in the Luriel School Division. And they are about to finish their program. So we have a few episodes left. So I'm very saddened because they're going to leave and because we've kind of actually figured this thing out <laughs> and just when we get reasonably good at it the everybody leaves and then new students will come on board and we have to train them but that's the beauty of being a teacher that's the beauty of such great education that people want to partake of so you you're you blazed a trail other students see what you're doing and say we want a piece of that action so good for you guys lily what do you do in china and new year's in New Year's, um, in traditional, it's like uh, many of uh, fireworks and also baked dinner. And we will stay until the midnight, wait for the bell, and then celebrate. But recent years, for the Chinese people, they travel to some warm place, party mm. with friends. It's oh, so they're becoming westernized. Yeah. They're, and that's the beauty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the family... I mean, less we we have talked the last time. The family members they get less and less. We don't have huge families anymore. So means maybe several families gather together and then they get a big party. Mm -hmm. So it's all about the party for you guys, right? On the <laughs> beach. And let me guess, you're having dumplings. Is the <laughs> yeah. is, is the big yeah. food? Lily told us the big food in China. <laughs> yeah. The celebratory food is the dumpling. Every time every <laughs> festival every festival so in new year's this year with your family here in winnipeg was it dumpling city yeah okay so your daughter loves dumplings uh sort of <laughs> she prefer pizza and burgers yeah she'd rather have a big mac when the duck fiddle she'd rather have a big mac wouldn't she <laughs> So, so you're really becoming westernized. That's a shame. That's a shame. Well. <laughs> anyway, that no, that's very good. That's all. Uh, that's all smart. So what now? Where do you go for fast food? Are you a fast food person? Yeah, of course. Of course. What do you eat? Yeah, like burgers. Like, and where's fries. your place? Where, where's your burger place? Um, actually, I think maybe burgers. Like Burger King and fries, McDonald's. King. Oh my gosh, that's. That's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm still a fan of that Big Mac, that uh, Angus burger, which they've taken off the menu. So I have no reason. I wander aimlessly now, kicking empty burger containers down empty back lanes looking for purpose because they don't sell that right now. Anyway, enough about this great, tr great information that everybody really gives a, a, really a tinker's darn about. 
we have a guest today mm -hmm. who's one of our very cool guests for the whole year. In fact, McLean's 15 years ago featured him in a small article as one of these young university people who was kind of influential in path, career pathing. And, and they asked a lot of questions of him. This is Damien Matheson, who is the director of partner development with www.myblueprint.ca. What's interesting about Damien being here is we use his program and his team's program exclusively in our division for career development, and it's a great program. So we're super happy. Damien, welcome to our podcast. This is amazing, guys. Thank <laughs> you. Thank so you amazing. for having me. Yeah. No, we're, we're, we're super happy to have you because generally – we take just students. We want to know the student story. So when I told you, Damien, we want you on here, we want to know you, the student. So mm -hmm. you're in Toronto. Now, how did you celebrate New Year's? Uh, there was no jumping in waves. Um, there, were, there were no dumplings, unfortunately. Uh, we were with my partner's sister and, and her partner. So just uh, a small group of us played a new board game that one of them got for, for Christmas. So pretty low-key night, but we'll take it. It was a good company. I'm honestly all break. I feel like I'm 80 years old. I got to, this is what we do now. We look for puzzles. And it sounds like, Damien, you be very careful. You're still a young guy. You need to get out and you need to do things and make sure you're pushing your brain. Anyway, Damien, we want to know about you, the human being, and a young person in formation. When you were in high school, where did you go to high school? Tell us about yeah. that experience. What, what was it like for you? Uh, I went to a wonderful high school in york region ontario so a uh, town of newmarket it's called sacred heart catholic high school i did uh, catholic education all the way growing up from from grade three it's a thing in ontario uh, and it was amazing high school i got uh, a chance to go back and uh, visit it a few years ago and still standing strong still some amazing people coming out of there um, pretty formative years that uh, helped me develop start to develop into the person i am today um, it was a fantastic high school. I can't, so, can't recommend so, it enough. So what kind of courses work. did you take down there that you thought were influential to you now in this path that's happened to you? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you don't think about it at the time when you're in high school about kind of the, the stuff that you're learning and how it's, it's really going to apply uh, later on. Sure, you know, you're going to ask those questions about why am I learning this? When am I going to need to know the Pythagorean theorem, right? But there's a lot of skills that will develop in, in classes that aren't the point of that class that have been super helpful for me now. So uh, when I think back to some of my more interesting classes that are, that are worth talking about, uh, I took drama all throughout high school. And that allowed me to build the muscle of uh, getting up in front of people and, and making mistakes and having fun and coming out of my shell a little bit. So uh, drama, we had some amazing drama teachers at, at our school. Um, was a, a pretty pretty big class for me when I was in high school. Well, that's pretty cool. Give a shout out to your drama teachers. Who were they? Yeah, I know Miss Forte. She's retired, uh, but uh, she was a, a fan favorite. I, I had her all four years. So that's we awesome. had a, a big grade twelve play. We did Clue. Uh, I was oh Wadsworth the Butler. So it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So you that was your big role. Now was this when you're going from grade nine to twelve? You have to build up to get the big role in Clue, or were you one of those prodigies that they had to give the lead role to all the time? I like to believe uh, <laughs> that I'm a prodigy. <laughs> uh, at least that's what my mom will tell me. But no, I mean, uh, I was Simba in the grade two production of Lion King. There you um, go. So I, I think from an early age, people started to notice that I, I have some chops. No, it, it was it was a merit-based thing. There were certain roles in Clue that certain people were just a better fit for. And I think I, honestly, I think it was just because I was able to memorize the lines and uh, the Wadsworth character had the most lines. So it, it worked out for me. Hey, so now you're taking lots of drama and lots of liberal arts courses. How good are, were you a math type? Did you like to do the sciences or were they something you just put up with? You know, it, it's an interesting question because I, I loved them um, in, in elementary school, at least math. Science, 
I, I appreciate, um, but it was just never my thing. You know, some people love science and some people, you know, make jokes about the periodic table, right? That, that was never my thing. Um, <laughs> well, they dress, I, I they dress up as a periodic table on Halloween. I saw someone right. do this. I thought, you got to be a science nerd, man. <laughs> right. And that's awesome. It, it's really cool yes. to be passionate about something that you're really interested in. Science it wasn't for me. Math, I did love. I Again, if we're going to go back to this prodigy example, uh, in grade five and in grade six, I won kind of our class-wide math contest that we did every year um but then it kind of dwindled down after grade six that was that was the peak for math you know i i had a i didn't have a great experience in grade nine math i think it was partly me in grade nine uh, and and the teacher and i maybe didn't jive as well as, as we could have and after that i never really got back on on the math train uh so it was, it was pretty much a liberal arts focus after that i took math all the way through high school and you know it's, it's a very important skill to have well you have um, to. but i'm not a mathematician by any means yeah yeah that's well that's now you're when you think about all that though that's 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 fascinating stuff do you use a lot of your math today or just the regular basic stuff uh you know i a lot of the basics like the times table was something uh you know the, the 12 <laughs> by 12 that is still something that I'm very proud of. You could throw any two numbers in that 12 by 12, and I can probably get it pretty quickly. Um, no, I, I think, you know, and today it, it's less important to be able to, to memorize, you know, uh, and, you know, I'm not a math expert, so I might get correct on this, but you don't have to memorize information anymore. You, you have to know how to search for that information. So mm -hmm. if I can't figure yes, out yes. the problem, um, I'm going to be able to go and search it. I might not remember the equation to the Pythagorean theorem, but I'll be able to know how to find it and then apply it. So yeah, I, I'm right not. When, when, when you're building a deck, you can pull it out and use it. You know, I was watching somebody speak during this COVID climate, a parent saying, I'm helping my son or daughter. And Manitoba Education has launched this um, uh, technology virtual space where people can go with all kinds of lessons. It looks pretty good. And the parents said, well, geez, I'm helping my kid. I have to relearn all this stuff, <laughs> which is fascinating to speak to. If you have to relearn this stuff, what was the point of doing it if you don't have to use it ever, right? That's crazy to me. Hey, how was your parent life? Like, not you, well, not your parent, like your parents, working with your parents, were they supportive of you being a drama kid or did they have different aspirations? Because I noticed in part of your bio and McLean's, you wanted to be a lawyer and your whole yeah. family are police. So you remind me, my favorite TV show is Blue Bloods. So I was yeah. thinking you had the chance to be the Blue Bloods family and you started doing that and turned your back on that. <laughs> I don't know if I would phrase it like that, <laughs> but uh, they were very supportive of, of me throughout. So uh, growing up, it was uh, my mom and, and two brothers. So single parent family. Uh, brothers are a little bit older than I am. Um, one of them uh, still a police officer. My mom worked with the police and, and since retired. Other brother has, has nothing to do. So not totally uh, blue blood. But, okay, okay. Um, the, the older brother who's still police, actually, he's uh, he's got a really interesting job right now. He's a de detective with the, the homicide division. So you know, oh he gets to gosh. solve murders for a living, which is, is pretty cool. So that's TV um, stuff. It, it honestly, when I hear about the little bits and you can't share too much information, obviously, but it does sound like a TV show half the time. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. No, they, they were always very supportive, um, I, I think, you know, and and. We can get into the story of, of you know why i'm so excited about what my blueprint allows students to do but i think part of the reason i was interested in law and, and this field of, of policing is because it was just around me so much right and, and that's what happens a lot of the times that students especially when they're growing up they they know what they know right so if their parents or their, their brothers and their siblings are in this field and you're exposed to it a lot that's what i knew uh, but basically what happened was they sat me down for dinner uh, I think it was grade 11, as, as you're starting to think about uh, post-secondary opportunities. And they said, look, we have enough cops in the family. We don't need another <laughs> cop. So, take it a step further. Uh, try out law school. See if that's something you'd be interested in. And, and so I thought that was great because, you know, if we're talking about TV shows, there's a lot of great lawyer TV shows, right? Well, and that's what happens in Blue Bloods, right? Jamie went yeah, to yeah. lawyer and yeah. then went back to cop in the show and Aaron became a lawyer. So I just, I okay. watched the show. I love it. So yeah, now, like your 
<laughs> but what? <laughs> so, so what turned you off about lawyering? Yeah, uh, it, it's something that uh, I'm really happy that your students are, are doing this and getting exposed to these types of opportunities because I, I wish it was a mandatory thing at, at every grade level and every school across the country, uh, this idea of cooperative education or, or work placement. So basically what happened was um, after high school, I, I applied and got accepted to the University of Guelph in Ontario, and they have a program there called Criminal Justice and Public Policy. It's kind of a, a mixed program. Half of what you study is under the umbrella of criminology, and then the other half is public policy. So a lot of government and, and court related material. Um, it's supposed to be a good feeder into law school. Of course, you can do any undergrad under the sun and then apply to law school. But yes, yes. from doing my research, you know, they said this would help prepare you to make it that much easier and do a little bit better on the LSATs, the, the test you have to write to get accepted into law school. So I did that, and, and as part of the program, uh, near the end of it in, in third and fourth year, there is an experiential component where you get to dip your toe in the water and experience life in the legal field, uh, whether it's you know um, working alongside, uh, working, uh, sitting beside a lawyer in the courtroom and watching them debate, or working with a paralegal. You get to dip your toe in a few different places, and it honestly was that. It was an experiential opportunity that turned me off from it. Uh, it was not what it looks like on TV. There was far too much reading for me to be. <laughs> um, so luckily I have. I'm an English right? teacher, luckily, man. You're killing me. <laughs> no, but I love to read. Uh, you can maybe see it behind me a little bit. I have a bookcase full of books there. But um, this this is the type of material I don't like to read, right? It was legalese. It just wasn't for me. Uh, but so luckily I had that opportunity, right? A lot of times co-op may get you interested in something, but it may help you decide that that's not for you. And, and if I had gone to law school without having that opportunity, I would have wasted a lot of time and a lot of money. So, mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Isabella, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, from what I was reading on your interview, uh, you mm. were talking about students having the chance to fail and then learn from this and go move on to a new experience. So yeah. when you figured that out about law school, uh, what was like that pivotal change? Wait, I didn't like this. What am I going to do now for you? Yeah, that that's a great question. And um, you know what? I, I'm not going to lie. I, I was I was worried, right? Um, I just invested all this time and this money into a four year. Uh, Bachelor of Arts program, and and mm -hmm. for whatever reason, there's this weird stigma with with Bachelor of Arts programs that, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, what kind of job do you get after sociology, um, or or anything like that, which is not the case at all. And I'm happy to debunk that. I'm happy to point people to a lot of resources that can show you all the amazing things that come out of a Bachelor of Arts degree. But I had this, you know, I, I had this moment at the time. I, I didn't know what I could do with a Bachelor of Arts degree. I my whole plan was to go to law school, and then, you know, all of a sudden, that's not for me. So what do I do? Um, that, that pivotal moment, you know, and, and I say this all the time, I, I was very fortunate. I, I, I got a lucky bounce. I, I acted on it, um, but the, the opportunity was there for me. So uh, basically what happened, this is a wonderful company that I recommend all of you look at afterwards. It's called Talent Egg. Uh, it's a Canadian company, and, and they help a lot of young people find opportunities, kind of find their first roles and, and things like that. Uh, I would subscribe to their newsletter. They let me know about this brand new program at Ryerson University in Toronto that uh, had, had just launched. Actually, it was a pilot program. It was called the uh, Digital Specialization Program, I think. Um, it, it was brand new at the time. The idea was they wanted it to be interdisciplinary. So they wanted to recruit students from all different disciplines, STEM, arts, you name it, put them all together. And Ryerson has this really cool thing. Uh, it's called an incubator. So it's called the Digital Media Zone. It's, it's run by Ryerson, um, but essentially what it is, is it's, it's a space for early stage uh, tech startups. So companies who want to build that next really cool piece of software, they get to incubate uh, their team in this space and learn from others and learn from mentors and have all these resources and, and options that they wouldn't have if they were trying to do it on their own in their parents' basement. So this program, because it was created by Ryerson, essentially took the students who got accepted into that program, which I was, I was lucky enough to, uh, and they put us in this incubator. And it was a three month program and it was all experiential. It was all hands on. There were no tests. There were, there were no books. There were no exams. It sounded like a dream come true, right? <laughs> and essentially what it was, was they, there was only seven of us. It was a brand new program. 
Um, so they split us up into two teams. And, and the first week was kind of team building 101 and come up with an idea. And then you took that idea. And as a team, over the next three months, you actually had to build that idea into a company. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what lit the fire under my butt, uh, so to speak, and, and was that pivotal moment that I always knew, you know, like every 18 year old or at that point, 21 year old that you're interested in, in technology. But I could sense where the world was going and I know I needed to be better at it than just being good at PowerPoint and Microsoft Word. So uh, I'm a big risk taker. I'm a big believer. And in, in, like you said, Isabel, learning from, from failure. So I said, yeah, let, let's try this thing. What's the worst that could happen? I'd spend three months, I'd make some new friends, I'd learn some new skills. And luckily for me, that's really what turned it on. Um, I, I found my interest and my interest is in, in software and in technology and in, in creating things. Um, so I got lucky that I, I saw that email, um, but I also jumped on it, which a lot of people don't do. So you have to be willing to take that risk and not be afraid to fail. Well, was that one of those crazy emails where it just kind of pops in and you're and most people just delete it right away? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't a personalized email. It was. It could have been spam for all you know. It could have been spam, and, and today <laughs> those emails probably are in my <laughs> time. So That's I'm very fortunate that I got that email. Yeah. Right on. Hey, now you talked a little bit about those digital skills. If you were to talk to a student, a high school student, let's say we're all around here at the table, all high school students, what digital skills? I like what you said. I needed to do something more than PowerPoint and Word, which really are becoming ubiquitous. These aren't, these aren't mm -hmm. even things you teach. They're just expectations that you have a sense of these programs. What do you think yeah. a kid ought to have? in his digital cachet as he or she leaves high school? That's a tough one because just ju ju just to make their way in any program, because these skills are becoming almost necessary in every industry, don't you think? Yeah. Which ones uh, do you yeah, think? Yeah. You know what? Um, to your point about expectations, I, I think it's almost an expectation that you're familiar with the Google suite of products and the Microsoft uh, suite of products. So your Word and PowerPoint, your slides and Excel and Sheets, uh, but you said those are expectations. You know what? The, there isn't one. I, I think instead of one tool, and it's not a technological tool, it's um, the ability to be a, a lifelong learner. Um, there's going to be a new tool next year and the year after that. And it, it, you have to have the ability to learn that new tool and you have to be uh, willing to change and willing to adapt because whether you are or not, those new tools are going to come and you're going to have to learn them if you want to be consistently moving forward in, in your life. So I, there's no such thing as, as the one tool, but the ability to learn the new tool when it does become available. Yeah. So the suites actually create the worlds in which you exist. And if you can work in the worlds, then you'll be able to adapt. So you're saying this resilience and this adaptability is really important. Yeah. Okay. And Damien, one thing I wanted to know, so you started working with my blueprint and like you just said, um, technology is always changing. So how is it for you to um, adapt to these new technological things that are coming up because you are in direct contact with that? So um, like, what do you do to learn these tools and apply them so fast? It's a great question. And um, you know what, my biggest issue isn't the willingness to adapt and, and learn. It's actually almost the opposite that because I am interested in, in this world and you know, because I do like to create, when I see something new, it's like a shiny thing and I want to go to it and I want to use it. And and one of the things that I'm trying to focus on this year in, in 2021 is, is doing less. So instead of trying each and every and using this, really having a purpose for what that thing is. Uh, but I mean, to, to answer your question, I try to use something when there's a, a use case for it, right? So I haven't downloaded TikTok as an example because mm -hmm. I cannot think of a good reason to use TikTok <laughs> other than to waste time. Um, and that's not true for everybody. I, I've heard so many amazing, like we published a, a blog post about how teachers are using TikTok to engage their students in the classroom because students use TikTok. So why not teach a 60 second math lesson on TikTok meeting your students where they are? So there may be a reason for you to use that thing. But for TikTok, as an example, I don't have that reason. And I'm trying to do less with social media unless there's an intent behind it. So I guess uh, to answer your question, when there's something new that I want to try, I figure out what's the reason, what's the purpose that I'm trying this. And I apply that tool to that reason. Uh, and then if it's successful, I'll hopefully keep using it. 
the nice thing is that um, in the world of software that, that we're living in, a lot of companies are moving to this model of, of what's usually described as freemium, which is try before you buy. Uh, there's usually a free version of the tool that you can sign up to, play around with it. It may be limited in its feature set. It may not have all the bells and the whistles that come with the pro version that you have to pay for, but there's still enough there uh, to get you to um, that, that moment of value, the aha moment to see if you want to keep using it. So it's easier than ever to try these new things, but at the same time, there's more than ever to try. So I'd say figure out why are you using that thing before you just sign up uh, and give away a bunch of personal information. That's kind of cool how you evolved, though, because you were in the traditional police work, law, and then you, at Ryerson, you found the startup culture. Talk about what the startup culture means to you and what emerged from Ryerson. You had a very cool little startup of your own. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll answer both, but I'll, I'll continue the, the Ryerson story. So, the program was put you on a team, three months, build out the thing. Um, for us, and, and we pivoted, which is a fun word in, in technology, I means just we, we changed the idea a few times. Eventually, what it became was um, there was a service in Toronto at the time, and it's still going now, and, and now there's a lot more of them. Uh, but this was, this was a few years ago. Uh, it was called Grocery Gateway, where you could order your groceries online. At the time, it seemed like a brilliant idea. Um, we wanted to do the same thing, but we're a team of three people and we realized that we don't own a grocery store. So it's going to be a little bit harder for us to do. Uh, but there were a lot of farmers markets that were happening in Toronto. There were like 33 at the time, but they were either running from nine to two while you're at work or three to seven when you're on the commute home. So we thought, why don't we bring these farmers markets online? You can learn a bit more about the farmer, the produce, their story, customize a basket from that farmer's market and then have it delivered to your home or to your office if you're not able to get to that farmer's market and support local and eat fresh. So that was the idea that came out of it. It was, it was called Food Story. Uh, but at the time that we, the program finished and we started the company, there was two of us. We didn't know what we were doing. We were two young kids out of school. We took a shot. Uh, it, it didn't work without getting into too much details. There weren't enough margins. There weren't enough uh, areas for us to make profit selling the food on top of what the farmers already charging for it. But we learned so much uh, from from doing that, which is how I developed a lot of skills that, that I have today and how I learned that you're never done learning, right? You're going to have to keep learning every single day uh, if you want to keep up with the pace that this world is moving at. Um, to answer your other question, Adrian, about like, you know, what was it? How, how did I adapt to the culture? What or... attracts you to that culture? Like what... So now you're in Blueprint, which is a startup culture. It emerged the same way that you guys did. I don't know if Gil and 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 the team were just uh, perhaps a little older, a little more mature. I, I don't know. Or, or, or they just saw a, a greater target possibility for it. Yeah. How did you get so involved in such a culture and what ignites you about it? Honestly, I... I... I think it's that I love learning new things. And, and that might be weird to hear as a high school student because a lot of the stuff you're learning is uh, you're learning, you're being told to what, what to learn, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you become an adult, actually, no, you can still do this in high school. There's a lot of yeah. things that you're very interested in that you want to learn. Uh, when you're an adult, you just don't have somebody else telling you what to learn, right? So the startup culture is you having to learn what you want to learn and what you need to learn in, in order to succeed. So. I think that was, that was really it for me that I finally had that moment where I'm done traditional school. I get to choose what I want to learn. I'm going to choose to learn the things that I'm most interested in. Looking back, I wish I had applied that mentality during high school and, and during my undergrad. There's no reason you can't be learning what you want to learn outside of school, right? Um, so it, it's that that got me excited that knowing I get to pick what I want to learn and this is what gets me out of bed every morning. The My Blueprint story, um, they actually started you know, around the similar time that we tried Food Story. Uh, it was a research project at University of Western in Ontario. Uh, they just did a much better job of building into a company than we did with, with Food Story. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Yes, I Lily. have a question. Is um, um, I'm not very clear about your career path. So mm -hmm. you graduated from your... The, um, the Gorfin uh, University, right? Guelph. And, mm -hmm. Guelph, yeah. And after that, you went to this three months uh, program, and mm -hmm. then after you went to, uh, you you join my blueprint. Is that right? Close. I'll I'll paint the picture for you. You're very close. Yeah. So, okay. let's say I finished at Guelph in 2012. Okay. Um, 
and then I go to Ryerson and worked on this company that lasted about a year and a half. Uh, mm -hmm. during that program, one of the best things that I did for myself, and I can't recommend it enough to everyone listening to this is found a mentor. Um, there's actually a, a really great Canadian organization. Uh, I think it's called Futurepreneur. It used to be called the Canadian. Yeah. It used to be yeah. called the Canadian Youth Business Foundation. Uh, and, and one of the things they have is a mentor or a matchmaking service. So, you know, we were trying to start this company. We were a couple of young students. We didn't know what we we're doing. And uh, we found a mentor through that program and she works still works at Rogers. She's been there for probably 20 years at this point. She has a really great job. And as we were winding down this company, you know, I was having a conversation with her and she said, you know what, you'd be a really good fit for this new division of Rogers that's getting started up. I, I think you should check it out. And it was a sales role. And mm -hmm. it was something that I, I hadn't really done before. But again, I'm a risk taker in the sense of what's the worst that's going to happen. It's my first job. They're going to give me a paycheck. I haven't had a paycheck yet because this company thing didn't work out. Um, I worked there for about a year. It was really great in the sense of, uh, because it's Rogers, it was a bigger company. They invested a lot in, in training. So I learned a lot of the important skills that I still carry with me today. And then uh, about a year in, I, I met Gil. And I learned about the My Blueprint story. And you know, for anyone who's less familiar with My Blueprint, uh, it's an online education, career, and life planning resource that makes it easy for students to research and, and create a plan for life after high school. And when I talked to Gil and I learned about what he was trying to do with my blueprint, I had one of those light bulb moments where, you know, we, I talked about earlier that I was exposed to policing and law because that's what was around me. And I think that still is the case for so many students. They, they don't know what they don't know and they know what they know. They know what's around them. If I had my blueprint when I was in high school, I might not have just blindly listened to my mom and my brother and, and went in the direction of thinking I want to go to law school. I would have known there are more occupations out there than police officer and lawyer and doctor and accountant. And who knows what would have happened as a result. I'm very mm -hmm. fortunate for the balances that have, have come my way because of that. But uh, I made it my mission to make sure that no other student has to solely rely on, on what is in the four walls and the home yes. that they live in and can use my blueprint to, to find more options. Um, yeah, I have a read on the interview that you uh, moved over to business development at my blueprint, but I have no very clear view about uh, what exactly is your role about. Yeah. Can you You're introduce not a little bit? Either. Yeah. I'm not sure um, he knows either. So <laughs> I'm not sure I know either. Uh, it's, it's lending myself to do amazing podcast interviews like this. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, this is this is the, the whole thing's a sham. I don't even think he works yeah. there. It's, uh, it's a I hope Gil doesn't story. find out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> honestly, business development can mean so many things to so yeah. many different people, like like so many roles. I I like to tell people don't focus on the role. Focus on on kind of what you get to do within the role. So don't focus on the title, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in business development, for the most part, usually means that you're helping to create new business. You're developing mm -hmm. new business for your company which usually means you're developing or bringing in new revenue. So there's definitely a sales element uh, involved in my role. I get to um, work with people like the Adrianos of the world and, and learn about their amazing uh, frameworks for career development and, and then talk about how my blueprint might be a tool to help support that mm -hmm. canvas. Right? So um, business development really just <laughs> means you get to help create new business. And, and in today's world, you know, it's so different than what it was in the past. It's, it's not just picking up the phone and calling someone or writing an email, but it's getting on a podcast like this or starting your own podcast, which is what that banner is. There we go behind me um, to, to let people know about the value that you and, and your company offer to hopefully make a match and, and make everybody happy. OK, so what do you think about your experience about your law? Uh, I mean, the criminal justice and public policy background help for your current position? Um, Is that it helped <laughs> in in the sense like, well, I, I laugh because I go back and forth on this all the time. You know, the, the world is changing so much. Um, you know, a, a typical four-year post-secondary degree, mm -hmm. people used to think it was the the ticket, um, mm -hmm. it, it, and it's not anymore. Like, there's a lot of successful people that haven't gone to post-secondary. I mm -hmm. still think post-secondary is incredibly valuable, but I think what I learned at post-secondary, the skills that I learned weren't related to the books that I was reading. So, mm -hmm. in the job that I have today, and and I'm not alone on this. There's I don't know what the stats are, but the the people who are 
um, either underemployed, meaning that you know they have all these skills, but in the job they have, they're not really applying them, or they're just doing something completely different than what they studied, like like myself. Mm -hmm. It's a huge number across Canada and in most countries. Um, so, am I using the what I learned about the difference between you know the types of laws and and how the court system works and mm -hmm. how public governance works? No, I'm not using that, but. I, I use my time management skills that I learned mm -hmm. in school. I use so many uh, skills from public speaking to uh, how to handle feedback to mm -hmm. making friends and living on my own and taking care of myself that I did develop at school. So the book part, not so much, but the life skills very much. And, and that's why I'm still a big supporter of post-secondary, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's a silver bullet like, like it used to be. You know, Adriano, why I ask this question is because in China, it's like um, the students after their high school, they, they, most of them, they don't really understand what the major they choose in the university. And they, yeah. like uh, many students, they just uh, study or, oh, I couldn't say that a waste their four years or three yeah, years time yeah. there. And then after that, they have no idea what they can do with what they have learned. Well, welcome, well, welcome to university in North America. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah but like it uh, yeah. there's uh, many of people that they couldn't really follow what they have learned in university yes. as their career, right? Well, Lily and I have had these conversations, Damien. It's like mm. if you were a lawyer in China, yeah, that's something they really aspire to become. They put that on a high, high level. And we were having conversations thinking, yeah, it's important here, but it's just one of the professions in in Canada or or in, in North America. Mm -hmm. And every profession gives you possibilities to do things, like you said, at policy levels. Politicians are often lawyers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. Accountants are are often lawyers. CAs are often all, uh, accountants and 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 politicians, and have have leadership roles. So it's interesting. We were talking about, but we see around this table, Damien is Gen Z over here. She's, you know, ready to tell me to shut up. And then there's <laughs> there's you, the millennial, who does that regularly. And there's Lily Gen X, and I'm the baby boomer. <laughs> and I'm looking at thinking, you dumped the law thing? What are you, crazy? <laughs> because that's what, bit, I, and I'm not thinking that, but that's what baby boomers yeah. like to think, right? They have that sense yeah. of traditionalist job that makes sense. So I... Even when you were talking to your parents saying, I'm not going to do the lawyer, I have a deep sense inside of them, a little piece of them died, oh, but yeah. they supported you yeah. because they yeah. love you and they want to take care of you. And that's that's a different attitude. In China, if someone decided, hey, mom, I'm not going to go into law, you're pretty much ostracized, aren't you? <laughs> like, So what's the plan? No yeah. plan. <laughs> <laughs> that, that another thing is very important for me is I learned from Damien is about, you know, he, he chose a totally different uh, career yes. about mm -hmm. what his study background, right? Mm -hmm. And then he got this opportunity. But as my understanding is like, if you don't have this background, it's very difficult for you to get yes. into the door, right? Yes. So I think that kind of experience could inspire some students like, okay, I really not very clear what I decide I'm learning now. Yes. But maybe I change my, my idea next year. Well, you've changed your mind, Lily. Lily's yeah. a classic example. She's a Gen <laughs> X who came from China. She was an HR yeah. director in China. And now right. she's come and totally changed. Yeah. She is the yeah. older version of Damien, who was right. in a traditional role and is now doing broadcast media but, and, and exercising all kinds of skills and developing all kinds that, of new skills. That based on my independent for economy, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For a new graduate student from university, the first priority for them is to find a job to yes, make a living, yes, right? Yes. And that's why most of the students, they will maybe, how to say, push themselves to do something they don't really like, right? Yes. Yeah. They don't have the opportunity to choose what they, they their passion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Isabel, let's, well, let's ask our Gen Z here. Mm -hmm. Isabella, do you feel pressure to go find a job or do you feel like I'm going to search around and discover until I find the right piece? So what happened to me 
I actually had been accepted to university and I was in between going to university or doing the broadcast media program for a year and a lot of people back home were like thinking I was crazy oh I'm <laughs> going to waste one year mm -hmm. um, doing a technical program when I would already be able to eliminate one year of my university and mm -hmm. I was like I already know what I want to do I want to be a journalist but maybe if I have this chance to learn as much as I can with the actual work experience I can just you know take university later I don't I'm not like old or anything and even if you are you can change <laughs> your career yeah. path whenever you want and yep. I think more people that are leaving high school need to know that you don't necessarily have to go to university right away mm -hmm. but actually understand what you want to do Yes. And if that's like one year that you're taking away from actually starting university, maybe that's a way that when you actually start, you're starting in the right path and you're not taking away one year of university because you didn't know what you want to do. You know? Yeah, but you, you still have the opportunity like uh, you take this one year to learn something you're interested and then maybe you take another one year for the work experience yeah. and then you find out uh, I need to go to university to learn yes. further yes. things. Yes. As, as you discover more very, about yourself. Right? Yeah, that's a very good yeah. process, yes. right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So Damien, like you've done what we kind of, you know about our Lean Career Design Canvas we use in Real School Division where people people do some heavy thinking the message of mm -hmm. it is that while schools are very good at helping you collect dots and you collected a ton of dots, but you seem to be kind of unique because you kept taking those dots and adding more and trying to connect them. So when you, when you met with Gil, who offered kind of this, was he almost a mentor type? Or, uh, he's or become one. He has become uh, but one, that, but he, that was not a relationship at the time. No. Yeah, but so he's and I. I know Gil's a pretty smart guy, and and, mm -hmm. and he has that quality in him, a, a very generous quality in mm -hmm. him. In 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 my small interactions with him, but mm -hmm. you collected so many dots. Did he help you then connect dots, like? Because you need the reflection piece, and that's what schools generally don't do, right? Mm -hmm. They help you collect, 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 collect. And, and if you have Damien's energy, you will continue. Like a couple of times you said, whoa, I better get on to something. I'm a little worried about this. Boom, you went on to something else. And I like what you said, Lily, because you're just learning more about yourself. But if you don't stop at some point, you had mentors. If you don't stop to reflect, if you don't stop even to speak to a, who might be per, someone who might be perceived as a career coach, mm -hmm. it's hard to connect those dots. Mm -hmm. You need sounding boards. And that's what that canvas does for a lot yeah. of kids in our, in our division. But what, what was the great moment when you kind of connected the dots and said, this is the whole startup thing for me. I'm in and blueprint. I'm in. What is it about blueprint that attracts you? Because you were in the food business. Now you're in the career business mm -hmm. as a startup. So what is it about this startup that connects to you? You know, I, I don't think that I've ever, one of the things I think about myself all the time, you, know, you hear a lot of people talk about find your passion, follow your passion, mm -hmm. um, which I don't totally buy into. And, and a lot I of people that I, I don't agree. Talked to, how do you know what your passion is when you're, I'm mm -hmm. 30 years old. I don't know what my passion is, right? Yes. Uh, but yes. what a lot of people do is, is they say, uh, find your purpose, you know, find your North Star. Um, so Isabel, for you, if, if you're interested in journalism, your North Star might be telling stories, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Figure out how you can do that, whether it's TikTok or through journalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, I... You know, for me, Adrian, I think it's more that I learned through the Ryerson program that I love creating things. So whether it's creating something in the food world or creating something in the software world and in the education world, I don't know if there's one vertical or one specific area. That well, I the would... blueprint's a little different, though, right? There must be a deeper sense of fulfillment as yes. you help kids help themselves in this yeah. career pathing, which is difficult. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, we're all blessed at my blueprint to be able to wake up knowing that we are truly making, you know, a difference, and and not to knock any occupation or profession. No, of but, course not. Uh, you know, when I was at Rogers for for the stint for a year, we were essentially selling advertising. Um, the the nice part about it is we were selling advertising to small businesses to get them on the first page of Google to hopefully make them more money. Um, which is great. But for my blueprint, we are, we're providing a resources, a resource that is helping students to make more informed decisions about their future and, and hopefully avoid some of the pitfalls that, that I had to make along the way. So I do feel good about it. You know, um, my, my, the big thing that I'm pushing right now that you're going to probably hear a lot more from me this year is my purpose that I'm going to focus a lot on this year is um, in a perfect world, I would get rid of grades and tests altogether. I, I think grades and tests, they do more harm then they do good. Um, so that's what's going to be driving me this year. And, you know, it's a little it's a little strange for me to be on on that pedestal, given the fact that I'm at my blueprint. And, you know, we help students in this world of education who are beholden to grades and have to use grades to get to post-secondary. But I just don't think they, they were designed in a, a time that isn't 2020. And I don't think that the, what, what they're doing now is solving a need that we currently have. Well, I don't think you're far off on that. I, I think there's a lot of research out there that supports that standardized tests don't make anyone smarter and the information is lost quickly after if you don't use it in some constructive. I like what you said earlier in an interdisciplinary, you didn't say it, but an, you're talking about interdisciplinary projects or works yeah. when you when you're working on things that make a difference on, on projects. That's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Lily, you have anything else? Yeah, because I have read uh, his interview. Okay, you really ignited Lily here, so I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a little worried. She's got a daughter now, so everything you're saying, not now, she's had a daughter for a while, and we, we kind of, she's our tiger mom. She really works hard with her daughter. So she, everything you said, be very careful what you say now, Damien, because it's going right to her daughter, okay? No, 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 no. Don't give pressure to my guest, okay? <laughs> Yeah, because I, I have seen from um, uh, the interview material, they say that you plan to go back to an MBA course, right? Uh, that would have been uh, something that I probably wrote at the time. So that, that interview, yes. that McLean piece that you're referencing, uh, got to be uh, almost a decade old now. Um, it's five so, years old. Mm -hmm. No, it's got to be way more than five years old. I think Anyways. you're 25 years old. <laughs> mm -hmm. We can agree to disagree, but uh, you know what, really, I, I would, I would probably change my view on that. And and you know what, um, a lot of that is is you know something I meant to bring up earlier. Uh, so one of the things that Ryerson did kind of ignite, or was that pivotal moment, or or helped me adapt to this culture, is is really who you surround yourself with. So I was really fortunate because in in this Ryerson incubator, this thing called the Digital Media Zone. It was about five floors at Young and Dundas, which is you know, a very popular intersection in, in Toronto, yes. of just young entrepreneurs who are trying to start something big. And, and the excitement and the energy and the enthusiasm in there, um, I, I fed off of it. And, and there were a lot of smart people in there who are saying something similar to what I'm saying now, that yes. I think experience is, is really what you learn from the books and, and the tests. They what have was your role. favorite? What was your favorite drink on Dundas? Was I'm um, coffee wise? Was it a caramel macchiato? Are you one of those guys? No, uh, I think we had uh, a Keurig machine in there. So it was <laughs> I'm a little disappointed. I thought you'd be hip and cool around, yeah. and have some cool kind of drink. Oh, I well. just need the caffeine. It's not really important. That's, That's how right. I get. It. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right on. Hey, now, so what would you say to a young person? We're going to come to the end of this, Damien, because. Uh, you must be looking at your watch and have something to do. So uh, what would you say to a young person now as they're sitting some time asking this question out loud to the career gods, what should I do after high school? That's, that's the big question, right? And, and that's what everyone is asking. Um, what I would say is no one knows for sure. So... Mm -hmm your guidance counselor, your career counselor, they're wonderful people to talk to and bounce ideas off of, but make up decisions for yourself. Um, take risks, especially when you're young, but like we talked about earlier, it doesn't really matter. You can take those risks throughout, just be smart about them and, and don't be afraid to fail. It's one of the pet peeves that I have with the, the education system right now. And it's different with every classroom. And you guys are super lucky to have someone like Adriano, but 
when you think about a, a test in a normal classroom, are you, you hearing fail that, that. Are you hearing that? Yeah. <laughs> Take when you fail that test, notes it, right now. <laughs> it, it's really hard to climb back and, and bring your average back to something that you want it to be. But in, in life, that's not how it works. In, in life, you learn from your failures. And, and we're talking more and more about it in, in the 2020s that failure is something that you want to strive towards. Because if you don't fail, you're, you're probably not learning. You learn way more from failing than you do from succeeding. You learn what not to do the next time. So for everyone who's thinking about what to do after high school, think about it for yourself. Take in all the advice and opinions, but make up your own mind. Don't be afraid to try something because you're going to have eight or nine different jobs in, in your life anyways. So who cares? Try that thing for a year or two reflect on the skills that you're learning from it, right? You know what, maybe I tried accounting, it wasn't for me, but throughout that, I learned really great time management skills. I learned how to do my taxes, right? You can try the next thing. And if it fails, it fails. You move on to the next thing. Just be a lifelong learner and don't be afraid to fail. That's pretty cool. And and you live that mantra, which is, which is more powerful. That's why we want your story, Damien. When you've lived through the story and you share the story, then it's not just a one-liner a kid hears or someone who's listening hears and says, well, yeah, you've done it. You've lived it. You were worried about it. You took risks. And there's so many students, and I teach some, I, I teach, um, some virtual classes right now. So many students are very nervous about even breaking out of some of their comfort zones there. Mm. And I'm trying to push them a little bit online uh, in the smallest way, but you have to be so careful with with people's, you know, their 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 safety, their sense of 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 their mental health, mm -hmm. how and and just how comfortable they feel. So those are those are difficult, but for every little step you take that says, I'm going to try it slightly differently, you make yourself a little stronger. And if in every new experience that you didn't know about, that you tried, it just makes you a little stronger. And, and you learn something more about your ability, your resilience, your ability to overcome, your ability to acquire new information. And you start to gravitate to experiences that matter to you. But it's 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 those moments of gradual learning about yourself and 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 what your limits are and what your possibilities are. I love it when a kid says to me, "I've watched this. I've talked to somebody. How I want to acquire that. I want to go figure that out." And that's what our, our canvas is about: figuring out something about yourself. So you've done that. You're walking canvas to me. This, this, this person who kept iterating, you talked about pivoting, but you're iterating all the time. And so your life story is, is a powerful one. So yeah. Isabel, Lily, any, any last comments? Yeah, I think uh, what Damien mentioned for failure is very important, um, especially for today's world. The young generations, they grow up in a very comfortable, I mean, condition. And they, they are too eager to be success and too afraid about to be fail, mm -hmm. right? They are. They are. Yeah, and and, especially and in China. And but, the Chinese ch well, children. Well, here too. We mm -hmm. are so quick to say fail fast, fail mm -hmm. often. But are we actually creating the experiences where they're engaging in some kind of activity where it didn't go well? Mm -hmm. I, I say it slight, slightly differently. Mm -hmm. It's fail fast fail off and fix it fast. Mm -hmm. That's where the learning goes on. You got to move on this stuff. You can't just let it fester mm -hmm. and then feel like it didn't go well. Oh, well, next time. No, nah, fix it. <laughs> move on. Get at it. Yeah. And that's where the real learning goes on. When you start fixing things and you see better ways to do things and you make them stronger and better. I've worked in junior achievement for a, for a lot of years. And that was the mantra of junior achievement in, in, in the programs we won. And we were very successful in junior achievement because my attitude all the time was a kid was this didn't work. Fix it by the end of the period. <laughs> and by by jingo, that's an old expression that I'm, I'm even traditionalist on that one by jingo, they, they would fix it. Yeah. But what I want to mention is like the young generation should be understand that everything, the successful or the failure or this kind of things are just uh, comma 
in your life, not yes. food stop, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. it's like uh, what like Damon said. You the comma, should, yeah. the comma of our life. We should live our life like a comma. I like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. This, this is the great analogy <laughs> we're going to end on. I want to be a comma. Okay. Lily, you're brilliant. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Damien, any last comments for us about life and learning and about Blueprint? Don't you have a cool portfolio coming with my Blueprint? Say something about yeah, that you, before you go. Yeah. Now you'll hear lots more about this this new thing we're building, but it's it's based off years of feedback. It's something that you know drives us. We we, we do listen to the educators and the students using our program. And you know, Adrian, you talked a lot about reflection. This new digital portfolio makes it really easy for students to reflect. So if it failed, reflect on what went wrong and how you're going to fix it next time. Yes. But the two things that I'll leave you guys with: one, you know, we just talked a lot about failure. Um, there's something that you should Google and, and do with a class of students after this, Adrian. I know it's called the fear setting exercise by Tim Ferriss. Uh, I think he did a, a TED talk. It's like 13 minutes and it's essentially whatever the scenario is, you know, for Isabella, it was, should I go to uh, the, the school you're in now, the arts and tech center, or should I go to university? Mm -hmm. And you write out all the worst things that could possibly happen and they're not that bad. So it just makes it a lot easier for you to take that chance. That's number one the fear setting exercise by Tim Ferriss. And number two, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you guys to check out uh, this banner behind me. It's the competencies without a classroom. It, it's a lot of what we talked about today. There's this notion that we need to teach students and a correct notion. Uh, the important skills in, in today's society are the soft skills, the 21st century skills, the core competencies, mm -hmm. things like critical thinking and problem solving and group work and, and that kind of stuff, right? Adaptability, mm -hmm. resiliency, all the stuff we've talked about. It's so easy for the teacher to say, hey, guys, you need to have resiliency when you're older. That's what I the know, workforce is looking for. It's not right? enough. But what does that actually look like in the real world? Yes. So that's, that's mm -hmm. what this podcast is for. We yes. interview professionals and we ask them not only what they actually do in a day to day. So the high school student listening can get a better sense of what a civil engineer actually does at work all day. Mm -hmm. But then we also talk about what are those important skills? What are those 21st century skills? that you need to be successful there and what are the examples of those in action so you can kind of put a face to the name so to say right on that's great stuff well i think we've come to the end of the podcast i think this has been a long one but once we find a guest of this caliber well then we have to we have to dig and dig and dig <laughs> and we could be digging right to china with this guy we could. Yeah. this could be the longest podcast of all time <laughs> All right. Anyway, super happy that you're here, Damien. We we appreciate yeah. it. And uh, we look forward. Uh, we'll be working with Blueprint and Luriel School Division in, in, in the future. We see it as a key tool. There it is. We see it as a key tool for us to help students become empowered about their own possibilities. So we appreciate it. We're glad you're part of our team. And we're glad you were a guest on uh, the 12th edition of Adventures in Careerland. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. That was awesome. Guys, um, it's so nice to talk to you. <laughs>